I'm sure we can all recall the terror of being lost as a child. This week on Reading Aloud, the programme full of inspirational ideas for the classroom, we uncover a remarkable picture book that's helping children deal with just such a situation. Also in this week's programme, sharp knives and soup make a book really tasty. We uncover the design fault with synthetic phonics. Uh-oh. We don't pronounce those letters the same way every time. And our panel pick, Purple Hibiscus, a haunting debut novel set in Nigeria. But first, an author and illustrator who's managed to combine her warm and whimsical drawings of the animal kingdom with a serious message. She's Helen Cooper, who's been creating her unique brand of picture book for nearly 20 years. Books like Pumpkin Soup, the bear under the stairs, and a pipkin of pepper. I had a three-year-old daughter who had a habit of getting lost. And my automatic response to any sort of problem is go and find a book on it. But I've, although I found books about being lost, most of the books seemed to be saying, oh, it's horrible being lost. Oh, thank goodness I found my mum again. And that wasn't what I wanted to say. But if I said to my daughter, if you get lost, stay in one place, I'd see her looking around and not listening to me. I think the thing is, when you're using words with young children, they can't read yet, they haven't really developed listening skills, and you need pictures. This little white dot here is the duck who didn't stay in one place. If he had stayed in one place, his friends who were going back to that place would have found him. But even though they're very close to each other, now they're missing each other. And if you show children things like that in a picture, they understand. If you tell them in words, it's very hard to get the attention of most of them. Something was bubbling in the old white cabin. What was in the cooking pot? Pumpkin soup, made by a cat, a squirrel and a duck, waiting just for a pipkin of salt to make it the best you've ever tasted. The cat said, I'm going shopping. Oh, please, begged the duck, let me come too. But the duck hadn't been to the city before and he had a habit of wandering off. What if you get lost, the cat meowed. I won't squawk the duck, and if I do, I'll tell a police dog. Like this story is called... The reception class at Woodview Primary School has been enjoying the exploits of duck, squirrel and cat in the company of their teacher, Sue Hawker. The main thing I wanted to get out of the book was about the feeling of being lost. Um, I wanted the children to think about their own experiences of being lost and to empathise with the characters of the book and to try and bring out their own experiences of being lost and how they would feel and how they felt if they could remember. I'm lost in the city. He scuttled off in a terrible tizzy. I think there was a big health and safety message for them as well, um, bearing in mind their reception children. Um, they're only four or five years old. Yes, what do you do if you get lost? Well, exactly, yeah. So we did obviously a role play situation where they acted out what they could do if they were lost. Sharnay, I want you to be the little girl who's lost, OK, at the shops. And Tadisha, I want you to be Sharnay's mum. They were quite good at that and it really brought it home. So even those that hadn't had an experience of being lost, you know, if it happened to them in the future, they knew exactly what they could do. Ding dong. You must be looking good. Yes. Next time, can you, can you hold your mum's hand tight? Well done, that was excellent. That was really, really good. The children love this book because although they were animal characters, they were so human-like, the children could really, really relate to them. You know, they lived in this little white cabin in the woods, but they went into the big city, they did shopping, they made soup. <laughs> the soup making came about obviously because uh, at the beginning of the story the animals are going to make pumpkin soup which is how it all starts because they haven't got the salt to make the pumpkin soup. 
For the children, it's a real life skill. It's learning about cooking. It's learning about using tools, uh, knives and things to actually cut. And again, you can get the safety, the health and hygiene message in there. Um, and, and it's you're also practical. Getting, yes, it's practical. Really you're also practical. getting the kind of smell of the book, aren't you? Exactly. When food is hot, you have to blow it. You do. Be careful. Because their favourite part of the book was the titious, delicious bit at the end. So, of course, when they came to actually taste the soup, you know, eventually it was, oh, this is delicious, this is really delicious. Delicious. Excellent. Do you know, in this country, six million adults have difficulty with reading? So where does it all go wrong? Do you like reading? No. You don't like reading? Why not? Is it boring? Yeah. Do you read the newspaper at all or magazines? I'll look at the pictures. <laughs> yeah. To me, reading is boring to me. Reading can be fun, and I think that's what we've lost in schools, that reading is, is, becomes a chore. Well, I'm with her, but is the current drive to teach reading through synthetic phonics the answer? Right! Synthetic phonics are coming in, as if you haven't had enough instructions. Soon, every school will have to use this method of teaching to read. Hooray, say some. If it works, use it. End of story. Well, I've got a bit of a problem with that. First of all, it's only had one trial, and the school where it was trialled, some say, had a little bit of extra help. But there's another problem, and it's the problem with all phonic systems. English isn't a language that we write down phonically. We don't write down sounds the same way every time. Look, I'll show you. We're going to make the sound ow. Well, obviously, we can write it like that as we do in cow. Or we could write it like that as we do in the word sound. Or again, we could write it down like that as we do in the word bow. Uh-oh. We don't pronounce those letters the same way every time. That could be O as in row. That could be O as in you. And that beastly thing could be cough or tough. When we learn to read, we have to recognise thousands of these. And no one method will work for everyone. We have to be flexible. And another thing, we have to constantly keep proving to children that books are a wonderful place to go. Now for a debut novel that made it into the running for the Orange Prize for Fiction. No small achievement for the writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She set the novel in Nigeria, where she grew up during the violent military regimes of the 1980s and 90s. The novel is seen through the eyes of a 15-year-old girl who resists the control of a fanatically religious father and an oppressive state. Where is Chimwe Dijeza? Papa asked when we got to the front of my class. A group of girls stood at the door, talking. I looked around, feeling a weight around my temples. What would Papa do? Chinwi's light-skinned face was the centre of the group as usual. She's the girl in the middle, I said. Look at her, Papa said. How many heads does she have? One. Papa pulled a small mirror out of his jacket. Look in the mirror. I stared at him. Look in the mirror. I took the mirror and peered at it. How many heads do you have, Gyobo? Papa asked, speaking Igbo for the first time. One. The girl has one head too. She does not have two, so why do you let her come first? It will not happen again, Papa. So a scene there where Kambili's father is taking her to task for not coming first in class. But, um, Sonia, how does Kambili's father view his children's education in this book? It's a, a strange thing. Obviously, he wants them to do well at school, but it's not enough to do well. They must come first. And... I actually found myself disliking him intensely um, because of his daughter is so afraid before she goes into her exam that she's tortured. And then when she gets the examination result where she comes second, 
she's terrified of telling him. She's already anticipating the pain and the worry of being shunned by him, punished by him, not loved, not hugged, not smiled at. And I felt torn for her. I mean, becoming second was pretty fabulous, but clearly not good enough for her father. So as the girl is the narrator, John, we see the book through her eyes, mm. is this tension that Sonia's talking about, is that really the theme of the book? Yes, it's the principal theme of the book. Um, as you say, book told through the mouth of a 15-year-old girl, Kambili. She and her slightly older brother, Jaja, live in a rich, elite Nigerian family. The father is a maniacal Roman Catholic patriarch who um, exhibits a massive contradiction between his public persona and his private reality. In public, he is a giver of gifts to the poor, uh, an elder in the local church, uh, an employer of grateful employees in his factories, uh, the publisher of a newspaper that courageously stands out against the oppressive and corrupt military government. In private, he is a authoritarian sadist uh, who terrifies his wife, he beats his wife, and he also is prepared to torture his own children when they incur his displeasure. Uh, and by the end of the book, when he dies, I, like Sonia, was pleased. I hated him so much <laughs> that I was glad that he was killed. And there is a tragic ending. The, the mother, the most put upon and an honourable of people, is driven to poison him. Uh, using poison which, which uh, she gets from, from the family maid because of his completely uh, dreadful, abusive behaviour. Sonia, the, the book's set in Nigeria. Do you think we get a sense of the place, Nigeria? Can we smell it? Can we feel it? Can we hear it? Not for me. Um, the, most of the prose is written in received pronunciation and therefore I felt that it only felt as though it was in Africa when they spoke to each other, when they used their little endearments. Um, other than that, no, and the food. The food was evocative. But other than that, uh, it could have been the Nigerian family living in England for me. I must say I got an intense flavour of the country. You uh, did. Uh, mm. uh, and, um... The clearest insight that I've ever had into contemporary or very recent Nigeria. It gets beyond that feeling that a white liberal position might have, that you can't say anything negative about a black mm. culture. Mm. It gets beyond that um, because it's written by somebody who's operating from within that culture. Purple Hibiscus is a book in a specific time, in a specific place. Is it a book, therefore, that can talk to all kinds of children, do you think? I'm, a, I'm very approving of the youngsters in Britain reading about other countries and reading about other cultures. And I think this is a really nice, gentle book which tells you about difficulties in other cultures without sounding barba too barbaric. The behaviour of the father is extremely extreme, but I think it's realistic as well. So, yes, I would approve of reading this, perhaps with a year, uh, 10, year 11 group. Well, that's about it for this edition of Reading Aloud. I've said my piece on synthetic phonics, made a little literary soup, <laughs> and discovered a stunning debut novel. What a packed show. Join us for more next time. Bye.